I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Black Wolf Renaissance Podcast. Your boy, David Bella, one fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance, checking in with my brothers, Jalen and Kelly. How y'all feeling? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy, Jalen, man. Another quarter of the Black Earth Renaissance. Feeling good, feeling great, man. It's a new year, 2021. Yes, we starting it off strong. Y'all already know we got pods already on deck. So uh, ready to get this thing started, though, man. What's good, everybody? It's your boy, Kelly, here. Checking in, checking in. Happy to be here on in 2021. Starting off the new year in quarantine, but it's all good. It's all good. Hey, Amen. Your boy, your boy caught the COVID, but it's all good. It feel all right. Hey man, it's it's crazy how the shit go, man. I hope I ain't the one gave you that shit, my brother. I ain't gonna lie, we was together, and I was I just got off the quarantine shit. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but <laughs> but it's we, all we good. Hope, yeah, man, my brother feeling good. We still in good health and good spirits, and we here for another great podcast as usual. Um, before we get into it though, y'all, and introduce our guests, I want to ask that everybody, um, you like, subscribe, rate, comment, uh, leave a review. If you're a new listener, first time listener, or a long time listener, give us some feedback. We definitely love to hear from you all, um, and really just want to do as much as we can to make sure we pouring into y'all and giving y'all the information, the type of content that y'all need. Yeah. Now, with that said, y'all got to introduce our guests. Man, we got we just had a fire conversation prior to the pod, and we are excited for this episode. Yeah. So on this episode, y'all, we got. A good brother out of North Carolina. He's a comprehensive financial planner. He's the owner of a firm. Uh, it's called Capital Wise. He's the owner of a lifestyle brand called Melanin Money, which is helping black people learn about finances and close the wealth gap. He's also launching an app called My Pocket Advisor, which aims to be a social network to help people bridge the gap with their accountability and their finances. We got none other than the good brother, Mr. George Atchapong. George, how you living? Hey, man, I'm living good, man. Good. Good to be on here, man. Hey, man, appreciate you coming on, my brother. Thank you so much for taking the time out your day. I know it's a new year, you know, everybody with their family and stuff. So we're glad you could come on here and drop some gems with us. Absolutely, man. Pleasure's all mine. Yes, sure. sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. And uh, we're just going to get right on into it, my brother. And the way that we normally start it off is just for anyone who isn't familiar with you, can you just... Let us know, you know, how did you start your journey on entrepreneurship? What was the catalyst for that? Yeah, great question. So, you know, uh, back in 2009, I graduated from college. So I'm telling my age a little bit here. And if anybody who's familiar with the timeline, we know around that time, the economic environment was a little bit in a little bit of turmoil. Right. So I had interned for Coca-Cola the whole time I was in school. And I was supposed to have a job as soon as I graduated in marketing because I, I majored in marketing and economics. And so when I graduated, they tried to keep me on as an intern. Like, hey, we can't really provide you this job, but you can stay on as an intern. I'm like, I might have adult bills, right? Yeah. These student loans yeah. spending hit. I got to get an apartment because I ain't going back home. Um, and so I, I just knew that wasn't going to be the move. And so I tried to sort of figure some things out. And at the time, you know, it was kind of like a little willful, just ignorance, right? Because I was like, well, I'm 22, I think at the time, whatever it was. And, you know, I couldn't find the ideal job that I was looking for. So I was like, hey, let me just venture over into this commission only financial services role, right? They, they sold me on the dream. I can make whatever I wanted to make, which was in theory was true, right? But I didn't realize that that meant that the only way I was going to make money is if I, you know, got it and got it myself. And so I jumped into that. And luckily, because I was humble and listened, um, I was able to, you know, actually do pretty well and have some success there. And then from there, man, honestly, like I said, that was over 10 years ago, but the rest has been history, man. I just like, I jumped into it. Honestly, at the time, thought it kind of was a job based on the way they explained it, but it wasn't. And the first month went by and I didn't see a check. And I was like, yo, what's going on here? Um, but I quickly started to learn, you know, with the ins and outs of entrepreneurship. So that's how I got my start um, in uh, entrepreneurship. That's fine. I like what you how like that start of it because that's not typical for many people. You know, a lot of people they uh it's always like they were either at a job, got sick of it, mm -hmm. or they just kind of started really, really young. I like that, like it was with that that situation you were in, it hit you like the true essence of it with that, oh damn, I got a job, but this job did not pay me. This is really a business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You know, and then, you know, when I kind of look back in hindsight, you know, there were some flashes of entrepreneurship that I didn't even realize. Right. So like I was I did a little bit of like MLM stuff in college and, you know, I paid, paid for the Miami trips. 
you know, I was uh, selling people stuff in college. Didn't forgot about that. That was like a little stint that I did. And then what else? I was cutting grass, you know, when I was young. So there was always flashes of it, but never really mm-hmm. thought my career would be an entrepreneurship, right? That was just like doing what I had to do, washing cars, figuring out ways to make money. And it's not until you get older that you realize it's not common, right? Like most people, that's not how they approach it. And when I really started to look back and realize that entrepreneurship was for me and always has been, it was this funny story. I used to be a, a bagger at Harris Teeter in high school. And um, one day somebody, you know, had an accident in the bathroom. I'll, I'll spare you all the details. And so I walk in and then walk out very quickly, go to the customer service desk. And I'm like, yo, like, uh, where's the janitor at? Because, you know, somebody got to uh, handle that bathroom. It's crazy. They looked at each other, kind of smiled. Somebody came from around the corner, I mean, around the counter with a, a mop in a bucket. And they like handed it to me. I was like, you want to go find him? Like, where's he at? And they're like, nah, you, you have to clean it. And I walked out. I quit that day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like little moments like that. When I look back and, you know, kind of piece it together, it's like I was born for this and didn't even realize it. That's interesting. That's powerful. And I kind of want to go back to like the school part. You were in school and well, graduated school around a very pivotal time. And uh, like mm-hmm. you said, you know, the thing happened with the internship. What was your major in school? And then my follow up question after that is, do you think college was beneficial? Because that's a big question that people are talking about right now. And some people are bashing college. We all are college graduates here. Um, so what's your thought on it? Do you need that to be successful in today's climate? Great question. And so, you know, so the first part of your question was, what, what did I major? In? Like, tell yeah, me a little bit. Major. Of, yeah, I majored in marketing and economics. Right. And the economics was the secondary. It was like, I just needed like two more classes. So I was like, let me go ahead and pick this up. Uh, with the business admin admin degree. And so it just made sense. But I really thought I was going to pursue a career in marketing. Um, naturally, it ended up being beneficial because as an entrepreneur, the, the second most important thing is getting your message out there, which is why people promote with y'all, right? Like mm-hmm. the second thing is getting your message out there, which we probably will talk more about later in the podcast is a catalyst to really growing your business. But um, so I, that was ended up being important, but I never thought I'd have a career um, on the finance side. That was just kind of a byproduct. And then the second part of your question about is college essential now? You know, I, I have no regrets about my college experience. I think from a relationship and connection standpoint, it was probably more beneficial there than it was like the technicalities of my degree, right? If we're being hundred percent honest in terms of like how I apply it to my today business. But I think, you know, in today's climate, I won't say it's necessary. I won't be one to say, don't go, it's bad. I will say that like, there are other ways to be able to get the education you need. What I do think is colleges have to um, entertain like more specific methods of education. Like there should be no reason why we walk out of college and don't know about personal finance. There should be no reason why we don't understand credit. There should be no reason why we don't understand how to invest, right? Like, so there there are certain things that colleges have to alter. um, And I think it could still be good, but if not, um, you know, it's, there's definitely more economical approaches. I mean, there's there's more stuff that people have learned from courses that they've taken from me or probably courses that y'all have that, you know, they're making them real money today mm-hmm. than some of the stuff they pay thousands upon thousands of dollars for to school, right? And so the school just have to realize like, look, the game has changed. It's the information age, right? And so we can't have this same setup and the same approach and think we're going to basically, you know, for lack of better terms, pull, uh, pee, in our, pee in their face and tell them it's raining. Right. Like we got to give them, you know, what they deserve and make this a more equitable arrangement. Right. What other situation would you pay thousands upon thousands of dollars with not even an inkling of type of guarantee or, you know, opportunity for jobs? Right. It's like, hey, like I I hope it makes sense. I hope it works out. Like that is insane. Right. So maybe I've seen some small micro models pop up where, like through certain accelerator programs, where you don't pay on the front end. Right. You get the trade, get the skill set. And then when you get hired and get that job, you kind of pay a percentage on the back end until you fulfill the obligation of the education cost. Hmm. I think that's fair, right? Especially if it's a, if it's a really, really premium skill set, right? And a person's able to get that without paying on the front end. But they're going to have to adjust how they approach it. But expecting somebody to pay 40, 50, 100 grand with no guarantees and not even teaching them some of the fundamental life skills that they need to thrive outside of college is a big no. Hmm. And I'm, I'm glad you bro. touched on that piece, bro, because like that you said something in there, like that personal finance piece about people going to school for all that time and leaving and not knowing this stuff. 
And like that was the, the beginning of this for us because we started this out of college ourselves where it was like we stumbled into financial literacy and was like, wow, why are we not being taught this information? Mm -hmm. And like it really kind of led to the catalyst of this. And I kind of want to go now into you with your 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 job working with that financial services firm, like after being in college and not really learning and all that. Did, was that the beginning of like your true financial literacy education? Uh, like how did that kind of play out? Yeah, good question, man. Again, it's it's all funny how it connects, right? So if we if we take a couple steps back, right? Growing up, you know, I didn't come from money. I saw my family struggle. And so something inside of me, like even though I didn't know exactly what was going on, like I had this, I had this like instinct that it was related to finance, right? And so, you know, my mom will tell you to this day. When I was in elementary school, I was loaning out money to my aunts and uncles, right? Because I would get money cutting grass or doing certain things. And I didn't know the term interest, but I mean, logically, I was just like, hey, if I give you 20 bucks, I mean, I should probably get more than 20 bucks back, right? And so I was doing that in elementary school. Again, made no connection that this was going to be a career path. It just made sense to me because I was looking at my circumstance and I was like, man, this doesn't feel good. Like, and I feel like money is the reason for this. So let's solve the money problem. Let's have some, right? So that was probably like the first like self-taught start, right? Then you fast forward a little bit uh, to, let's just say, uh, what was it, my first or second year of college? That summer, my mom was getting remarried. And because of this whole track record of me just always being this frugal kid, right? Not wanting to spend any of the money that he got. She said, my, me and my husband are getting remarried. And, you know, would you mind like helping us like kind of figure out our finances together, right? Because we're joining our finances. So I put together this whole fancy spreadsheet. This was like before Mint.com existed and all that kind of stuff. And I had a buddy of mine who was interning at, um, at a financial planning firm when I was, when I was interning at Coca-Cola. And I said, hey, can you look at this? Is this like anything like what y'all do for the clients that y'all work with? He's like, I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. Like it's a little bit better, right? We don't get this detail in this granular. So I was like, hmm, okay. Again, good to know, but didn't think that it was going to be a career path. So that was another another indicator. And then I guess last but not least, to your point, um, working for the financial services firm, you know, that's when it really started. When I started interfacing with clients or they asked me to reach out or build my prospect list, they said, find 200 people who can, you know, you, who you can work with that have money to invest. I'm like, my people ain't got no money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was an eye opener. I was like, man, like it was a reminder that people in my ecosystem that I had proximity to, they didn't understand money. And then what really did it for me is a guy came into my office. It was him, his three kids and his wife. He was like 40, 43 at the time, right? Wanted to be a client, um, black guy, real nice guy. And he came into my office and he was telling me a situation, what he was trying to do. And I did the numbers. And this is before I really thought about like entrepreneurship, digital sales, right? Because I would have told him probably different advice in hindsight. But from a mathematical perspective on how we used to think about retirement, I was just like, yeah, man, you know, I don't see the path for you to stop working, right? Like mathematically, it wasn't panning out. And at the time, that's when it clicked for me. I was like, number one, the most important thing I can learn from this career is to absorb all the information necessary to make sure, number one, take care of myself, practice what I preach, make sure that I'm good, first and foremost. And then number two, to make sure that my people understand the gravity of personal finance, right? Because- Retirement feels so far away to most people, right? And people are only motivated by two things, to avoid pain or to seek pleasure. And when the pain seems so far in the present, or excuse me, in the future, it's hard for them to wrap their head around that, right? And so it's like retirement, whatever, right? Until they get there. And now they're, they're handing out stickers at Walmart, right? And the thing I always like to tell my peers, I'm like, what are you doing so wildly different than your parents right now. And let's just assume their parents are not in the best position financially, right? That makes you think that your life is going to be different because it's easy to say because you think you've got time. Like, oh, I ain't going to be me. I'm, I'm going to be financially independent by the time I'm 40. And okay, cool. Well, it's math. That's the beautiful thing about personal finance. Okay, show me. It's numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So show me how that's going to be possible. And most people didn't have an answer. Now, the beauty of that is the world has changed tremendously and there's a paradigm shift around financial independence instead of retirement, right? Mm -hmm. And so we understand that there's more creative and abstract ways, but not to deviate too far from your question, that's when it hit for me. When I saw a 43-year-old man with three kids and his wife in my office, and the look on his eyes was just so devastated, right? I, I, I hated that I had to communicate that message, right? And I was like, that would never be me. That would never be anybody who's willing to listen to me who has the time to correct it. 
found an audience, man. And I, and I like how you you found a problem and you you learned how to make that problem and then trying to find a solution for it. Um, and you spoke on on getting people kind of looking towards the future. How do you get people to do that? Uh, as a lot of times I come across people, they, they, they're they too nearsighted and they, it's hard for them to look forward into the future. That's a really great question, right? So what I think is the first step is you have to understand like what matters to you, right? And paint this picture, right? So I was in, I was in this conference one time and this lady said that in 2011, uh, a billion drill bits were sold, right? I'm not like the most handy guy, but we all know drill bits are the things you know, you put in the drill to hang up artwork, whatever, right? And she said, nobody that purchased the drill bit actually wanted the drill bit. And she said, let's assume that they use the drill bits to hang up artwork all over their house or, you know, their offices or whatever. They didn't even want the artwork. What they wanted was the feeling that they got when they walked in the room where the picture was hung. Right. And so what people have to do is they have to define their picture. Right. People are so head down day to day. It's, it's hard to look up or even imagine what does my ideal life look like? Because if you can take a second to imagine that. Right. The beautiful part about it is you can start to mathematically map that out. Like, man, what would it look like to be able to travel um, internationally once a quarter? What would it look like to be able and you start to like paint that picture? What does freedom look like? What does peace look like? What does fulfillment look like? What does happiness look like? Now, notice I'm, I'm not mentioning tangible like things. I, I'm, I'm keeping this very abstract because people need to define their own version of happiness first and foremost. And when they can define that for themselves, we can backdoor into a number because then guess what happens. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the account. It doesn't matter if it's a Roth IRA, a 401k, a brokerage account, right? All you care about is the fuel or the resources that you're going to have to be able to live that lifestyle, right? And so when you, what you do is you get people to focus on that, right? And then we just backdoor into the tactics, because when you talk so much about the specifics or, or people in my space want to flex their intellectual prowess around these advanced strategies, it's cool, but it's a means to an end, right? The concept is I want to wake up without an alarm. I want to be able to take care of my family. I want to be able to go where I want, see what I want, do what I want, eat what, like that's what you really want, right? So when you identify that, then you just have to atti- attach a number to it. And that's when we simply, you know, pull the lever on the tactics to make it happen. But what happens is when it feels like it's so far off in the distant future, people can't wrap their head around it, right? Because again, they're motivated motivated by pain or pleasure. And most people, if you think about it, if given the choice between a painkiller and a vitamin, they're going to choose a painkiller because a painkiller is going to solve your problem immediately. A vitamin is if you do the right things, take this over an extended period of time, it'll probably have positive health benefits. That's what retirement sounds like, right? It's like, if I take this back for the next 20 years, I'll probably be healthy when I'm 60. So you have to figure out a way to say, hey, look, let's bring that future pain into the present, right? Let's understand that that's what we want to avoid. But more importantly, let's not focus on the pain per se. Let's focus on what future pleasure we're going to be able to get from making these decisions now, right? Because motivation is a lot like taking a bath. It doesn't last, right? You got to do it daily. So some people are, some people it's a vision board. For me, it's a daily declaration. Every day, every morning, I'm reading, who is George? Who am I? Right? What life do I live? What type of business do I run? Right? What type of man am I? I read that every morning. Right? And it's only so, so long you can go without looking at that and making sure your actions don't align to you mapping towards that. Right? And then also giving people an opportunity to do something small every day or at least every week that makes them feel like they're already there. Don't push it off forever. That's the, one of the biggest mistakes I think I made my early years of entrepreneurship. Head down and just, you know, I'm, I'm going to come up for air whenever, 10 years later, right? Like, no, enjoy some of that now. What does a wealthy life look like? Travel, okay, cool. Take a, take a two-day trip to a city that you can drive to, right? Rent an Airbnb, right? Maybe it's me playing golf once a week when the weather's nice, but making sure that you, when you identify what that ideal life looks like, that you figure out small things that you can do right now and not push it off to the future. Hey man, that was a beautiful answer to that question, my brother. Oh, uh, thank you. You made me think whenever you were talking about that identifying that future goal uh, about money master the game. It was a concept in that he exactly talked about. That's what I thought about. That freedom number and like how people not only like they think that what 
it's such a larger number than what it has to be. A lot of times people always think I need 10 million, 15 million to, to be comfortable. And like in that book, as he was breaking it down to a lot of these people to live these extravagant lifestyles that they thought like compared to what they had, a lot of times it was a lot more realistic. And it was a, a principle you said in there, you just got to start putting numbers on things. Mm. And I, I just yeah. think that's so important that you mentioned that, man. Yeah. Just as Matt, man, it's, it's so like inspiring when you just do the math, right? Like people, all, the biggest buzzword ever, six, make your business making six figures, make, make it six figures. It's 273 bucks a day. You know what I'm saying? So, so you're focused on a hundred thousand and let's, let's keep in mind, if we can keep it in the book for the record, a hundred thousand to your point ain't shit. And there's a lot of more numbers before, you know, after that number, right? So you can make 800,000 and that'd be six figure. I keep hearing six figures. I don't think people default to a hundred thousand, but mm. bigger numbers. Okay. But anyways, right. And so my point of bringing that up is like 273, right? That's what you focus on. Two seven. Like what can I do daily? People, people want to like get out of their situation so bad that everybody's searching for a shiny ball. Everybody's searching. It's like the lottery ticket syndrome. Right. If I just had this big check, it'll solve all my problems. If I could just get the, no one foot in front of the other every single day this year, well, we're in 2021 now as of this podcast, but in the, in the pandemic, when I couldn't go to the gym, I noticed your boy was falling off a little bit. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's a little, too, a little bit too much love and I'm love him. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this ain't it. You know what I'm saying? Self-awareness is key. And so I was like, you know what? I don't care about the circumstance. I'm going to turn my health back around and get back into a much better shape, right? So I lost 25 pounds in, in, in a global pandemic, right? I got in the best shape of my life since college in a global pandemic, right? And so I bring that up only to say this. The way I got there was by simply tracking what I ate on a daily basis, making daily deposits to getting better. And then I look up four months later, I'm in the best shape of my life, right? I didn't just jump over the hurdle or try to do a, a detox tea or a three week challenge. Like, no, just one foot in front of the other day after day. And the results will come, right? Stop chasing the shiny ball. Stop trying to circumvent the process. The process is the process. And it's the same thing with your money, right? You got to just one step at a time, right? Same thing with business. It's like, if I can just get a uh, $250 sales a day. You know what I'm saying? What does that look like? You know, but everybody just focuses on that big esoteric number and then they get overwhelmed and they didn't don't end up doing anything. Before we go forward into like full entrepreneurship, I want to talk on one more part with the personal finance. And I want to talk to you like after you had that realization with that one client who you told, you know, retirement looking real bleak to you. How did mm-hmm. you start to implement that moving forward and conveying that message to the community? What, how, what was your reaction to, okay, I got to make sure I get this information to people? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my first uh, brand on the internet was uh, Makes Sense to Me, right? Because what I realized, I was like, this, this personal finance stuff, like it feels like so complex to a lot of people. And if we could just make it simple or make it make sense, as they say now, mm-hmm. which I've been saying. Um, if we could just make it make sense, I feel like it will help people. So what I, what my way of doing it was taking the things that people were already doing and finding ways to like leverage that to educate them. For example, like we know food is a big budget buster for a lot of people, right? So one of the things, and to this day, you probably can search the hashtag. I believe the posts are still there. Um, but meals that make sense, right? So one of the things I would do is I would just like go to the grocery store, you know what I'm saying? Grab some food, boom, boom, boom. And I would break down. I was like, look, like this dope meal that I made cost me $273 a serving. Compare that to a restaurant, this same meal might cost 15, 20 bucks. What does that tell you? I may be able to take this money and now I can apply it to saving or I can apply it to an investing account. And if you keep doing that over time, you'll be able to really build that thing up. So I just try to make it really, really practical, right? Because like when people get all these industry terms and all this, these advanced strategies, they just get intimidated. So I just try to take things that they were already doing and find more efficient and better ways to do it. That was my method of doing it for uh, probably the first almost five years of my career, just really just breaking it down to these simple like lifestyle hacks and how you could like redistribute those resources. That's a perfect way to do it though. And like, it's just like breaking it down into the simplest form, explaining it to where like, 
someone who's in elementary school can understand it though. And I think that title was perfect. And if you still had it around right now, the SEO on it would be crazy. Yes, indeed. And before we get into the entrepreneurship journey, because I want to start talking about that. While we on this personal finance topic, quick commercial break, y'all. I need everybody, if you're interested in personal finance, trying to get your situation together, like we've been talking about, we have our ebook, our book, Manage Your Money Like the 1%. It's a step-by-step guide to money management and investing. Um, y'all cop that, man. It's really another resource in your in your toolkit. Now, sorry, shameless quick plug. plug. Shameless, shameless plug, plug, man. Hey, man, my boy Tiger got me on it. He said 2021, we got to come with that energy. Yeah, I'm with man. it. I love Donations it. I love it. I love and it. gifts. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, you know, what I'm saying like media is one of the most powerful tools. There, listen. I mean, we're gonna get into this entrepreneurship piece, but like, <laughs> like you got to get your message out there. So hey. I'm with you. And see, I got one more question. One more question before we go to entrepreneurship. It was yeah. the part whenever you was loaning out the money you tell your aunts and uncles, bro. That was hard, yeah. man. <laughs> like yeah. I wouldn't have thought about that. I probably would have just gave him some money, but I probably wouldn't have been like, "Hey, man, I need that plus plus that." Or they probably yeah, just would have jacked me. Yeah. I, I, give I, me like I, a yeah. or something. You know what I'm saying? Give me something. You know? But again, then I won't I won't say that I knew what I was doing. It just made sense, right? I was just yeah. like, I mean, I'm part ways with this money. I when I get it back, I need a little a little something for my efforts, you know? Yeah, so. man. Gotta pay me for my time. Opportunity cost. Yes, yes indeed. So yeah. all right, George. Now I kind of want to go into your entrepreneurial journey. So you were working at this financial services firm. I mean, you're learning all these things about personal finance, learning how you can help strategize with all these with people. When did you decide to move on from there and launch Capital Wise? Great, great question, man. So yeah, I was there and that's where I got like my licenses, my training, all that good stuff. And because it was a hundred percent commission setup, right? The whole setup was like, I think it started out like 90, 10, and then it like, went down to like 80, then I think tapered off at 70. But, you know, humbly speaking, I was killing shit. You know what I'm saying? And so like when the money started coming in and it was like, hmm, okay, they're, they're giving me back office support. They're giving me, you know, a couple of things, you know, the office space that I can leverage. Those were all quantifiable costs. So I went from, I went from being a financial advisor to a business owner, an entrepreneur. I started counting the cost, right? And I was like, okay, if my income my revenue keeps going up, but your percentage remains the same. That means that I'm going to pay dramatically more for these, this, these fixed costs that you're providing me. Right. Because I was building up my, I was smart enough to know because of marketing, I'm, I was building up me. I never really built up the firm. Mm. I never went out and said, Oh, mass mutual and HF financial were you know, the best thing since sliced bread. I was, I was betting on me. I was big enough myself. Right. And just leveraging them in the background. And so I knew that my success wasn't contingent upon that relationship. And so I had a conversation with the managing director. I was like, Hey, you know, really, I really do like what I've been able to do here. I mean, you know, you, you guys have been recognizing me for these awards and all this kind of stuff, which is great, but you know, I, I could give a hill of beans about recognition. You know, people, people will do more for recognition than they will for money. And if you're an entrepreneur, you can use that as a leverage mechanism, which maybe we'll talk about later, but yeah, people will do more for recognition than they will for money, but I'm not people right? Give me the money. And so they can, you can give me all these little plaques and stuff. I'm like, but look, there's too much of a spread here. My income keeps going up and we need to cap off what I pay up. And they weren't trying to hear it. They're like, well, this is the model. It is what it is. And I was like, bet deuces. So I left, I was smart enough to somehow, I don't even know how to pull this off. Like I didn't sign a non-compete when I started working there. Um, I guess they just thought nobody, I don't know what they thought. It was silly in hindsight, but I didn't sign a non-compete. So all my clients came with me, every single one of them. And so I left. And at that time, it wasn't capital wise. I had actually joined forces with another couple of other advisors at the time. Um, and we you know, built that practice for a little bit. And I started to learn more and more about the industry and how I wanted to grow my business. And then ultimately, uh, I switched from like a broker dealer model to a registered investment advisory firm, uh, which is a fee only setup. And so um, that's how I kind of made that transition. I just like realized that, you know, they were going to be taking too much of my money by me staying there. Right. And I, and I, and I didn't, I was already a hundred percent commissioned. So there wasn't any fear of like me feeling like, Oh, what, what's going, what's going to happen if I leave here? I knew that my brand name, uh, at least I felt like at the time would have been strong enough to be able to still keep pushing. That's real awesome. quick, George. Uh, I'm sorry, Kelly, before you ask your question, can you, can you break down the difference between that broker um, and that registered investment advisor just a tad bit more? Yeah, sure. So in the broker-dealer model, basically 
um, the advisor gets paid every time they place a transaction, right? So let's say you have an investment account with us and, you know, I need to sell some shares of a certain stock, right? Whether it's a loop, whether we are cutting losses or we're selling because you were locking in the game, I'm getting paid, right? And I didn't like that because I felt like there's a moral hazard. I'm like, okay, so we're, people are literally hiring us, right? To be their financial advisors. I mean, granted, investment advising is just one piece of it, but they're hiring us for that. But at the end of the day, I don't feel that we should be getting compensated every time we place a trade because it creates a moral hazard, right? It's like, if I know I'm going to get compensated every time, not that I would do this, but I can see how advisors would just be churning accounts, right? It's like, oh, just let's just move money around because anytime any transaction happens, we're going to get paid, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I didn't want to be affiliated with that type of infrastructure. And so I had to kind of unravel that and transition into a registered investment advisory firm. So the fundamental difference is one is a suitability relationship, meaning that I just need to do something that puts you in a better situation than you were before you met me, right? So for example, if your money was in a savings account, and I put it in an ETF, right? Technically, right? You're in a better situation than you were um, when you came to me, right? Or if your return is just, just called a five, six percent and it was in a savings account, you're in a better situation than you were when you met me. However, as a fiduciary through a registered investment advisory setup, I have a legal obligation to do what's in your best interest, right? Like I can't tell you what's good, I can't tell you what's you know decent. I have to tell you what's in your explicit best interest. And that's what I have to act on. Even if that means, let's just say, for example, for a certain client, there's a type of account type that maybe we don't do internally. And I have to send them somewhere else for that. But hey, look, we don't do this, but this is what you need, right? I can't try to force fit it to say, you know what? Well, you know, it's kind of the same. It'll still be pretty decent. Let's just go ahead and rock with it. Can't do that, right? I can get sued. And so that's the difference between the RIA in the broker dealer world is they just have to do something that is reasonable. I have to do this in your best interest. And you would think that should be the standard across the board. Right. But it's not. Uh, talking about the moving firms, man, and really how it's interesting to see how people just move with the person that they're with. Right. So you, your clients weren't, weren't uh, loyal, loyal to the firm itself. They were loyal to you. And you leveraging right. that to you for yourself. I think that's one of the biggest things with um, investment advisors or financial advisors. That that's one of the biggest things that people that are employed they can leverage, right? I, I have an investment advisor, and I'm not. He actually just switched firms as well. I have switched with right with them, like because I'm loyal to him, not necessarily the firm. And I think that's something big that people need to realize that if you're working, find your leverage and use it to your advantage. Facts, right? Build your, I mean, especially now, build your personal brand. Like that's what matters. And the beauty of that is it gives you the ability to evolve and people will still evolve with you, right? Because if they, if they care about you as you, as your brand evolves, as you try new things, because they're tapped into you, they'll most likely still, you know, rock with you versus if it's like you're selling them on the best products and sliced bread or the best um, investment firm that you, you're, you're working with, then when you leave or you evolve or you transition, they're going to be like, well, I thought you said that was everything. Why would we leave? Right. Versus if you're always focused on your personal brand, as that evolves, they evolve with you. That's powerful. And uh, I remember whenever you say, whenever you first start out, they kind of told you, you know, find 200 people that you can ask and get on to onboard. But you was like, I don't really know people like that who has this type of money. So what was your strategy to marketing yourself and finding clients so you can be successful? Yeah, great question. So again, another happy accident, right? So I was like, man, I don't know 200 people that would, number one, here's the, here's the first thing I thought before even knowing if they had any money. My thought was, I'm this young 22-year-old kid, right? who just left Coca-Cola from marketing, ain't nobody about to trust me to manage their money. That, that was my thinking, right? Originally. So I was like, why don't I come up with a different approach, right? Why don't I reach out to these people, these 200 people that I know and say, hey, something like this, hey, look, I know you're probably already taken care of. I know you, you probably have it all figured out when it comes to financial planning and wealth building, but you're someone that I admire and someone who probably is connected to people who might could use the services that I offer. So could I get some time on your calendar just to share with you what it is that I do? And if after I share that with you, if anybody comes to mind that I could potentially be a resource to, would you mind making an introduction, right? Here's why that was insanely valuable, but I didn't even realize at the time. 
Number one, their guard was down. They didn't feel like they were being sold. Number two, they, everybody likes to help someone. It's like, oh man, he thinks that I'm, I got it all figured out. Man, I, I feel good about myself. I, I definitely want to help him, you know, get to where he's going. Then number three, because their guard was down and I knew they didn't have everything figured out, it made it a much easier way to get in the door with them because once they actually heard what I had to say versus their guard being up, like, well, I don't want to listen to this kid because he's trying to sell me. And by the time I got finished, they're like, you know what? I definitely can introduce you to some people, but you know, th- this is a service that I could probably benefit from as well. So it end- I end up being able to get referrals and still work with some of the people who it was a good fit for at that time. Because I-, I got my start on the insurance side. A lot of what I did in the beginning was um, insurance, right? Life insurance, disability insurance, things of that nature, right? And so I was able to still get in the door with some of those people and then they edified me to their community. So now I had third-party validation because they felt this uh, need to help me because of how I came at them. So that was my strategy. And I was able to run with that for a while because I didn't have Instagram yet, didn't have any of that stuff. So I was really just pounding the pavement. Then I did a lot of networking events. Mm. Um, the firm that I was with at the time, they did a couple of press releases, like New Advisor in Charlotte, just you know, just hired. So I don't think that really did anything, honestly. That was just a credibility booster for when you Google me. But, um, but yeah, that was a real big play for me. And networking events, shaking hands, you know, actually offline, you know what I'm saying? Meeting people, building real relationships and doing good work, <laughs> you know? Because if you do, it's no different than e-commerce. If I get the product in the mail, I get the product on time and it's quality, guess what? I'm probably going to buy again, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's no different than a service-based business. If you do good work, right, what are they going to do? They're going to tell people about you. They're going to stay a client, which means recurring revenue, which means you got your base. So the real, the real game is be who you say you are and do good work. Don't focus so much on customer acquisition that you don't focus on retention and activation, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the real hack, right? In, in 10 years of doing this, there's no one that you could ever meet. I know it's a public po- podcast on a very big platform. Um, there's no one you could ever meet that could say, man, you know, that George, man, phew, it's a schemester or he, you know, he didn't do what he said he was going to do or it, I didn't get the results working with him. And anybody that didn't, if they did it, um, they would gladly admit that it was on them and not me, right? So just do the right things, do good work, be who you say you are, overserve the people that you have because people want to focus on scale so quickly, right? Mm-hmm. When the reality is it should be uh, systems first, right? Fo- first, you want to focus on systems, right? Because this this influx of cr- clients that you want, this windfall, it's going to break you if you don't have the right operations, systems. Mm-hmm. Then focused on serving, right? Overtaking care of the people that you have, that's going to give you a heightened awareness of what they want so that you can refine your messaging for the people that you want to serve. And then you scale, mm. right? That's the process. Systems first, right? Then on the back end, you scale. System serving, scaling. That's kind of my methodology, right? And I didn't want to rush the process and just like try to put people through the door. It's like, let me make sure I have the infrastructure that can support that growth that I'm crying. Man, I like that. The three I, S's. I, I love that three answer. Three S's. Yeah, I love it. The three S's. And I'm glad you touched on that piece in there about that infrastructure because like you were talking about everybody wants all these clients. Everybody wants to scale so fast. And we were talking about this off camera. People, mm-hmm. we, we hear all this stuff about business. We hear all these numbers and stuff and it sounds sexy. But if you don't have that infrastructure, you're going to end up being a bad business person who owes mm-hmm. money to the government. That's how it's going. Uh, you go owe money to the government or you go owe money to the people because you don't have stuff in line. So can we talk more about like how you can, as a new business owner, start like building infrastructure, like in systems for new clients? Yeah, yeah, man. Of course, it's going to vary based upon the nature of your business. But um, mm-hmm. here's what I would say. If you got clients, naturally, you probably have like a, a service-based business in some sort, whether it's like agency, consulting, whatever, right? So the first thing you can do is have a really well-documented like a CRM system, right? So like, what is your process from the moment someone opts into your free guide, right? To the moment that they're a client or retainer, right? What is that process? I, so I break it down into three steps, right? You have acquisition, that's getting the client. You have activation, that's providing the service that they hired you for. And then you have retention, and that's doing that more customer service work to really make sure that the client feels happy with their taking care and they're taking care of, right? So you want to make sure that you define the repeatable steps, right? That are in each phase of that process. You want to document it, right? So for me, my first ebook came from not wanting to repeat myself. And really that was just SOP. 
Like people kept asking me this information. So instead of resending this email, resending this text message, let me document. So your business is the same way. Document everything, right? So when you bring somebody into the fold, it's like, okay, what am I doing here? How can I document that step? How can I make it repeatable? How can I make it delegatable? Because one day you won't want to wear all these hats, right? And you want to be able to delegate, but you cannot delegate what you can't articulate, right? So you have to have a process that's well-documented, i.e. articulated. So when someone comes in, it's like, hey, look, this is the game. Because here's what's going to happen if you don't do that. You're going to feel the weight of needing help because you're growing, but then because you are growing and you're juggling clients and you try to go get help and just whoever can help you, you're not going to have the time to carve out, to slow down, to be able to get them up to speed. And now you got someone who's not operating efficiently. You're kind of paying, you're paying them, but you're not getting the most out of them because your process isn't well documented, right? So document everything. That's, that's the first step, right? Make sure you have a way to track all of the responsibilities and communications with the client. Right. You really want to see the lifetime value of that client. You really want to be able to tell that story. You really want to make sure nothing gets lost in translation. The best way to do that is to have a CRM system that's going to pull in all the data for each individual client. That's huge. Right. So trying to find emails like, hey, what, what did I say? What was that subject line? That ain't going to cut it. Right. So having like a really good CRM system. Um, other than that, I would say like you really want to um, get out of the way. Right. Like you, you want to set up your business in a way to where if you're the CEO, if you're the visionary, like whatever your role is, what is the thing that bogs me down the most? And how can I position that to be outsourced? Right. Whether it's somebody that's doing it overseas, whether I hire my first admin person, but start to piece together the, the, the help that you need so that you can free yourself up to work on the business and not in the business. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I love how in there you, you kind of talk to, hiring someone and the importance of a system. But I also kind of want to ask you, whenever you're hiring someone, how do you find someone who's matching what you're trying to do? Because sometimes your system could be great, but that person's mm -hmm. just not a fit for your company. Um, so how do you go about finding a person that's actually a good fit and a good mesh? Man, that is a, uh, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I heard this quote one time and it said, if you have extraordinary systems, you don't have to have extraordinary people. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you think about McDonald's, right. Mm -hmm. I don't need McDonald's, but it's an extraordinary system. Right. And so that's why I can pay people $7 an hour to step in and plug into the system. So what you're talking about is more of like a culture fit. Right. So what you want to do is, you know, and again, sometimes it's really hard to read this, but the best thing you can do is to be vulnerable with them and give them the space to do the same, right? So, hey, look, you know, we're a small business, you know, we're agile and because we're small, like, you know, we're very tight knit in what we do, right? And so part of what's going to make this work is understanding, you know, what you want out of this position, right? You can be vulnerable. Like I know sometimes people just want a paycheck, right? Like, but just tell me like, what is it, where do you see yourself in this situation? Because just like most relationships, people leave for one of three reasons, right? They're either unfulfilled, right? They're uh, undervalued or underappreciated, mm -hmm. right? So undervalued, not getting paid enough. Unfulfilled, I'm not doing work that makes me light up, right? Underappreciated, they never get recognized for the things that they do, right? So figure out what makes them tick, get that information on the front end. And then if, if, if what they're looking for aligns, like give them that space and that autonomy and say, hey, look, just tell me, sky's the limit, we're a small business, who knows where this relationship can grow? Like, where would you see yourself growing? Like, and if where they see themselves going doesn't really align with the direction of where you cast the vision as an entrepreneur, you have a tough decision to make right then and there, right? Because here's the thing. When you want help and when you're hiring, sometimes people look more attractive than they really are because you, you're, you feel like you're drowning, right? Or you feel like, man, I just need that help. So the question is, are you going to be objective enough in that moment to say no when you know it's not a good fit, right? And then when you realize it's not a good fit, are you going to be able to approach that person and say, hey, look, this is what, where we said we want to go. This is what's happening. Um, you know, it's not working out, right? Maybe there's a pro probationary period or whatever the case may be, but are you going to be objective enough to have that conversation? Or are you going to be like, man, well, it's going to put more work on my plate. I got to figure out who's going to do this now. If I, if I fire them, I haven't got the energy for this right now. And then now you're complicit in that, right? So really it's about objectivity 
as the owner of the company and understanding that thing, you, sometimes you might not know it until you get in it, but if, to the extent of what's possible, we'll be very transparent and vulnerable with them up front and allow them that same grace and just say, hey, look, we want this to make sense for you. This is not the Fortune 500 company where you feel like you got to wear a mask and you know, say what you ever you got to say to get hired, right? Like, let's, let's make this make sense or identify if it does so that we can save both of us some time and hit it, right? And be willing to have that conversation. I think that's a great way to approach it. And uh, fellas, if y'all don't have something, there's something he touched on in there that he touched on earlier also. And it was that recognition part. And I just wanted to go back whenever you were saying, you know, if you understand how to use recognition as an entrepreneur, it could be something very valuable for you. And I just wanted to know if you can explain that and kind of go a little bit deeper into what you meant by that. Yeah. So you guys ever used the Nike run app before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, Nike, the run app does a great job of giving you these arbitrary badges like, oh, I ran 50 miles this month or I ran this challenge. Like they do that because they know two things about human nature. People like to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. Right. And people like to be recognized for their accomplishments. Right. So as a business owner, if you have a team, right, how can you use that to your advantage? Right. How can you make sure that your employees or your contractors, or whatever they call them, that they get rewarded for the things that they achieve? Right. Because guess what? When they know that there's something in sight, they're going to go above and beyond to try to hit that milestone. It's almost like credit card rewards points. Right. Now, I use them strategically, but there's some people who they chase rewards points. Right. It's like, oh, I just want to get these. I want to get these points. I want to get these points. Right. And the reality is you're spending way more money to get the points in the first place. It's the same thing with like, if a company gives you a trip, right? It's like, we're going to give you an all expense paid trip uh, valued at $5,000 if you have uh, 50,000 in sales. Okay, sure, right? Or, but really I can just buy the trip myself. So it's like understanding that, right? Understanding that you can put those, you know, recognition mechanisms in place and people will thrive off of that. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's a reality. I mean, it's gamification one-on-one, right? Like how do I put those, those things in place for people to feel like they're a part of something bigger, feel like they're winning because that's what they're after. If someone is, is happily an employee that matters to them. Mm. You know, as an entrepreneur, you might, might meet a hill of beans too. Like I said, for me, pay me the money. You know what I'm saying? You can keep all the bells and whistles you want. You know what I'm saying? Like you can put a choke card on it, call it blue dog shit. Like Denzel Washington said, but pay me my money. You know what I'm saying? That's what I care about. And so, employees don't necessarily have the same, you know, they don't have the same gear, right? They're like, I want to be recognized. I want to matter. I want to feel, you know, fulfilled. Like I want to be appreciated. And so I think intrinsically as humans, we all have some of that, but as employees, for sure, they have a lot of that. So it's like using that for your employees, using that for like your customers, like, okay, it's no, why do companies use those? If you come seven times and on the eighth time you get a free, whatever, at the end of the day, the drink is six bucks, seven bucks. I'm gonna have to spend 70 to get that, but I'm gonna keep coming back because I like the idea that mm -hmm. it feels like I want, right? And that's all it is. Just understand how to use that with your customers and your employees. Definitely, definitely something for my entrepreneurs to think about and to kind of try to figure out how to weave it into your company. So, George, my brother, I do kind of yes. want to go into my pocket advisor now because that's a pretty yes. dope idea. You you touched on the Nike run app and I you kind of you whenever you equated my pocket advisor to that. So can we talk about if for anybody that's unfamiliar, what is my pocket advisor? And like just yeah, just break it down for them. Yeah, man. Super excited, man. So, you know, when I first got started in the business and I was running and ripping and shaking all the hands, kissing a lot of babies, all that good stuff to try to get clients, I realized very early on that like I'm gonna be here for a while. And I knew at some point I was gonna cap out on the way that I could serve people. And I was like, man, wouldn't it be dope if I could just like view my clients wherever they go, like almost like if I was in their pocket and boom, pocket advisor. 2013, I had that idea. 2013. Just give, this is for you overnight entrepreneurs that are mad that in six months, something ain't popped off, right? Mm. 2013. I started looking into the research of what it would take, what it would cost, like what it would do. And I just didn't have it at that time. And I was like, okay. And on top of that, I was still in the trenches getting my credibility as an advisor, much less, right? So I was like, let me just keep going. Let me just keep doing the work. Because again, this internet culture like wasn't as prominent, right? Like you couldn't just like run ads on a page like yours, right? You couldn't just do that, right? So it was like, you actually had to be somebody. And for lack of better terms, unfortunately, there's a lot of people on the internet who ain't who they said they are, right? And so I was like, you know what? 
that could be my, that's, I, I didn't even know that that was going to be a thing. But for me, I was like, let me just put my head down. Let me get to work. And, you know, I'll look up one day and it'll be the right time to launch this. Right. And so here we are 2021 um, and I'm ready to launch pocket advisor. So what pocket advisor is, it's a financial accountability um, platform. And honestly, it's pretty similar to a financial social network. Right. And so what that looks like is myself and other financial content creators, right. We are basically going to be the voices to be able to educate people who exclusively want to learn about personal finance. Right. Cause we can come on Instagram <clears throat> and to the best of our ability, we can probably curate our feed a little bit by following pages like yours, following pages like mine, but there's still a lot of noise. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with pocket advisor, the people who are creating on the creation side, they have to be vetted and verified by me and my team. Right? Like, okay, bet we, Senior work, we trust it. You can create content here, right? We're going to continue to expand that. I would even love you guys to be able to create some content there as well. Um, and so that's the first thing, being able to learn from a variety and multitude of financial experts, right? In one place, right? There'll be a series of advice channels, right? And so maybe you there's specific categories of information you want to learn, whether it's real estate, whether it's stock market investing, whether it's uh, a wealthy tax uh, savvy strategies, personal finance, whatever it is, there's going to be advice channels for each category, right? And so then you'll be able to hop in there and really kind of focus on the content that matters most to you. There'll be classes, right? So when you come on the network, you know, periodically throughout the month, we'll have different classes uh, that hosted by different experts. Uh, there's a feature called Axe Penny, right? And she's basically our brand character. And what that is, is behind that, there are certified financial planners who are on call who will be answering your questions just like, so the concept is almost like Siri, but it's a real person, mm. right? Like you can, but really ask a CFP, right? Like, Hey, I just got this bonus at work. Like, what should I do with it? Right. And based upon the nature of your question, it's going to be sourced to an expert based upon their credibility, right? So it's not a customer service person. It's not a call center. It's there's real experts behind it. And when that question comes through, it's like, it's going to be a filter for us. Like, Oh, this is really a tax question. We need to source that to this guy, or this is, and investment now investment is the tricky piece because it's more education because we can't if it's like a specific holdings question or like when you should buy something we got to kind of be careful about that because you know one to one will be considered advice but if it's like a class or a course or a program then that's considered education so people won't be able to ask like should i buy this right now but they will be able to ask questions around personal finance and everything else now but we will be teaching on the investment principles also um, other than that, man, I mean, there's just so much cool and exciting stuff. We're going to have somebody who's going to be posting daily deals and discounts, right? So instead of you having to try to be tapped into like all these different lists and emails, you're going to, you know, you can come on Pocket Advisor at any given time and someone's going to be able to, you're going to be able to find a flight deal and we're traveling again. Um, you're going to be able to find a bunch of different deals and discounts there. Uh, what else we got there, man? It's just so much, but man, really the, the more of the story, Pocket Advisor is going to replace your need to aggregate information from a bunch of different other places, right? Like if you want a centralized source with a bunch of different financial experts, educators, thought leaders to be able to learn and to be able to have a financial advisor essentially on call in your pocket, that's what Pocket Advisor is. And I'm super, super excited about it. So we'll be releasing some more information on it within the next probably four or five days, waiting on my videographer for the second video. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I'm really, really excited about it. Hey, that's dope, hey, man. man. That yeah, dope. Yeah. yeah, that sounds dope. Hell yeah, yeah. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Definitely, but, definitely but, ready to see that one. And yeah, get at us with the content, man. You know, we we always love that. That's our that's yeah, our yeah. mo. But I do want to go back in there for one before anything. If anybody wants to get involved, we're gonna make sure we're gonna have that link down there. I know you got a wait list. You mentioned that uh it's not live just yet, but it's gonna be live soon, probably by the time this is live. So we're gonna have that link down in the show notes for y'all. But I want to talk more to that overnight entrepreneur sensation and that internet stuff that mm. you talked about, man. Mm. Cause that shit is major right now, man. We see a lot, a lot of that going on. And like you said, you had this idea in 2013, and it mm. took seven yeah. years to come to fruition. Do mm -hmm. you think like this current space that we in, like, cause you know, you said, you mentioned this earlier, it was a lot easier. I mean, a lot harder back then to like, you know, kind of get your foot in the door. Now it's a lot easier. Do you think that like this, do you see uh, like, I guess uh, I'm trying to think, see how I want to phrase this. Like, 
a <laughs> reckoning not. for this, almost like like where this is going to like because I, I I know what Kinda you're talking like about. Bubble. Yeah, like a bubble. Yeah, like a bubble. Yeah, yeah. I, I got this quote that I live by, and it says, uh, "Time will promote or expose you." Right. Mm. So um, I look at it less like a bubble, and I look at it more like give it time. Right. Like, I mean, you look at apps like Clubhouse, right. And, you know, where it's real time and you got people on there like think, you know, Instagram, you know, yeah, Instagram live, but you can kind of control that a little bit. But like you're on these stages and you're amongst other experts. People thought you were an expert and they tee up a question to you. And you, you finessing because you don't know how to really speak to it. Time will prom- promote or expose you. So I, I don't I can't definitively speak to like like how will all play out and like like. Will there be a way to filter out who is legit and who's not and what that looks like? But I know just um, internet or no internet, that you, there's only so long you can go without not authentically showing up who you are. You'll get exposed. I mean, we see that all the time. I mean, it might take you know longer. And I feel like with the internet, probably it takes less long than it did. But we see you know, people getting exposed from 20 years ago and stuff, right? But now the internet is just accelerating that because we have you know more, more access to information. And I just feel like, you know, for those people who keep like finessing, like, especially if you've got over on somebody, right? It's one thing if like you're finessing behind closed doors and, and no one knows what you're doing, but when, you, when you're speaking and you got all this stuff going on and you're on stages and on podcasts talking about all you do and you got real people that you done messed over, like everybody ain't gonna be able to bite their tongue. And so I think that's what's accelerating is like people like, nah, I call bullshit. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that's the reality. So I think what's gonna happen is if people are smart, Right. They're going to stop like trying to be known for things before they know it. Like, I think what happens with a lot of entrepreneurs is they go out and acquire a piece of information and they want to know just enough to be able to teach it versus being an expert. Right. Like master your craft before you feel like you want to scream from the mountaintops. Now, I'm not saying you need to know everything. Right. I'm not saying that because the true essence of entrepreneurship is jumping off the building and, you know, building your wings on the way down. That's not what I'm saying. But be transparent about what you do know. And don't try to overstep your bounds on things, right? If you were stepping into this investor space and, you know, you see people talking about options and swings trading, but you just, you just really getting started on understanding the fundamentals of the market, teach on that, teach on ETFs. No, you hear one person say something about options trading, and now you're an expert on options trading. No, because people going to lose money messing with you, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, you can start where you are with what you teach and what you do, but just don't stem too far beyond that. Right. I'm a big advocate of starting where you are. I'm a huge advocate of that, right? Not being perfect, showing up imperfectly, huge advocate of that. But do that with what you have, the knowledge you've actually acquired versus like just getting a taste of something about, oh, I know I read one page on this and now I want to create a course on it because that's the new wave of selling courses. Mm. No, that's the thing. Mm. That, that's some good points to uh, touch on. And I kind of want to... Uh, go a little bit deeper on your entrepreneurial thing, just because you're saying, you know, we can be real. Like what's some mistakes that you personally made yeah. on your entrepreneurial journey um, that you feel like someone can learn from? Yeah, for sure. Um, not documenting things the right way in terms of like partnerships, collaborations and agreements, you know, uh, like my man Wallow, Wallow said the paperwork, make paperwork, you know what I'm saying? Like, got to have that paperwork in place, man. That was a huge mistake. Um, the other, the other, some other things I think I did is again, focusing so much on growth in the beginning. Like I got to grow, got to grow, got to grow and not stabilizing the business. Right. Not really stabilizing the infrastructure. So I'm speaking, speaking on that from experience, you know what I mean? Like in the early years, just like I was running. I mean, I, I remember I was meeting people on a Saturday. They, they didn't have the money on. I was driving them to Harris Teeter to get a money order. Like, I was relentless to close these deals. Um, but like just not focusing on the infrastructure of the business uh, as, as early. I think that was, that was huge. So that's why I'm a big advocate of that. Like we talked about offline in the podcast. Um, not amplifying my voice faster. Uh, I didn't get into paid advertising until late in the game. Again, I was an offline guy, you know, relationships, referrals, shaking hands. And then I had like an e-commerce brand that he looked at the page and the followers, like not a ton of followers, but like I always say, no matter what page you follow of mine, it's always more money than it is followers. <laughs> it's always more money than it is followers, right? And so like, if you believe in what you're selling, scream from the mouth. Like if you got that systems, you got the infrastructure, you believe in what you got, like bet on yourself with dollars, 
right? Amplify your message. That is probably the biggest, like if, if I know what I knew now, I would have invested 30% of my revenue into marketing mm. from, from rip 30%, 30% because at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. We all know about sales funnels, right? We understand the logic, right? And if you have a good product, if you have proven data that says people want this, like you need to get in front of more people, right? Mm-hmm. I never forget when I turned the switch on with advertising for the e-commerce brand. Like I got my phone on mute now because we're on a podcast and I want to interrupt the audio. I can guarantee at least seven orders came in while we was talking. At least. Mm. At least. I can guarantee it. Like my man Ben the systems said, and shit in place. Yep. Right? Got somebody else that manages fulfillment, right? And so it's like, that's another quick tangent. And this wasn't an issue for me because I'm always doing collaborating. But if you want 100% of the bag, you got to do 100% of the work. Ooh. ooh. Right? Give that man a message, man. Message. <laughs> 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 if you want 100% of the bag, you got to do 100% of the work. And that's where entrepreneurs go wrong, right? They want, like, I, I did this post and someone was like, owning 20% of my company is too low or blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, cool. Let's do some quick math. Zuckerberg, mm-hmm. don't quote me on these numbers because these are, they're very specific, around 11.23%, mm-hmm. right? Um, Steve, Bezos. Uh, Steve Bezos. Bezos, all these guys, right? like all less than 20%, mm-hmm. right? Billionaires. Right. But you want to own 100 percent of what? You know what I mean? Break bread with the right people. Again, have the paperwork in place. Right. But break bread with the right people. You know what I'm saying? And even before you get all your logistics squared away, even if it's rev share, it's like, hey, look, I know if I don't get somebody to do this, it ain't going nowhere. Right. So let me break some bread so I can get this thing off the ground. Right. Collaborate. Work with people like if you can't afford to pay somebody on salary. Figure out an equitable arrangement, right? That makes sense. Because unless you want to do 100% of the work, which means your thing ain't going to grow. If you can do 100% of the work for your company, it ain't, it's not big enough. <laughs> talk, it ain't big talk. enough. You know what I'm saying? One more time, talk. man. Message. <laughs> I love that. That's dope. <laughs> and so like, like you got you to gotta work with people. And then sometimes, you know, it might not always work out. Like it might be, okay, but you don't stop. It's like people who are dating, like you don't not get married or not pursue another relationship because one didn't go right. No, okay, wasn't a good fit. Let's find somebody else. I went through like four people before I found the right person for my melanin money e-commerce brand. I was telling my wife the other day and imagine if I quit. Now that, now that brand, right? <laughs> All I can say is I'm glad I kept going and didn't get jaded off mm-hmm. of a relationship, right? So it's like, you got to put people in place. Like you might see George, but there's people beside me, behind me, you know, that you, that you're not seeing that are, are helping me run this machine and I'm breaking mm-hmm. real bread. With you know what I mean? I'm not afraid to do that because at the end of the day, I'd rather have a percentage of something huge than to just be the face and then be juggling all this stuff, be overwhelmed, have no time freedom because I'm doing everything myself. And you ain't making the money that you want to make. You ain't making the money, right? Hey, I, I just want to say one thing. Whoever's doing your Facebook ads, man, you they're doing a, a fantastic job of mailing the money. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate it. Man, you might, we might need to tap in with them, dog. We are <laughs> trying to step them, them paid yeah, ads step up. Them Facebook ads up, man. Ads, Facebook ads, I mean, mm, tell you, bro, a game changer. Like, at some point with the Facebook ads, when you get it dialed in, it becomes, well, how much do I want to spend? All right, once you once you once you get it dialed into where it's a three to one, four to one, five to one, six to one, at some point it's just like, okay, well shit, let's spend a thousand a day. Let's spend two thousand. Why wouldn't we? Right? The data is substantiating that this makes sense. If a thousand right? make me five, shit, that's a win. That's the that's the problem though. People aren't willing to bet on themselves. Like they want it's almost like investing. They want these outsized returns, but they want to want don't want to take any risk to get it. So every decision that I had to make, I had to like gut check. It's like when I hired when I hired the ads team. When I had to redo the website, when I had to drop the, uh, the money on the samples for the new photo shoot and for the merch, so the campaigns were looking a lot more fire. Like I had to do that before a dollar rolled in. You know what I'm saying? I had to make that decision, right? I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was willing to bet on myself. I went into that knowing I could have lost thousands of dollars if those campaigns didn't pan out the way I wanted to. Plus, the, not to mention the ad spend on top of all that. Right. Mm-hmm. So you got to be willing to bet on yourself because you can't get the reward if you're not willing to take the risk, period. And that, 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 that sparks another thought in my head, just because, you know, you said I ought to put 30 percent into advertisement. I want to talk about percentages as an entrepreneur and how sometimes 
on the internet, especially, you'll see a lot of people say, mm-hmm. oh, yo, like you're saying, I gross, I made six figures, but they're talking gross versus what they're netting. A lot of people aren't being transparent to saying, you know, I made a hundred thousand dollars, but how much money of that hundred thousand dollars did I actually truly keep? So right. I just want to talk about like feasible numbers like that, because you say I don't put 30 percent into advertisement. You still have people you have to pay for. You still have systems that you have to pay for. And you still got taxes you got to pay for. Right. So the reason why I said that is because that type of advertising I'm talking about, the, the ROI is so quantifiable. Mm-hmm. Right. So of that 30 percent, probably 20 to 25 would be paid average Facebook, Facebook and Instagram advertising. Mm-hmm. Right. And I would only feel confident putting that much there after a proven track record of a certain level of ROI. Because at that point, right, let's just simple math, right? Put a thousand in a day, right? And I have time I put a thousand in, I get 4,000 out. And then for me, what I would do every time I got that return is I would take out what my original investment is, right? So that way it's almost like I didn't spend the money, mm. right? Which is another benefit of business credit. Right. But to, to break it down in, in, in more tangible terms for someone who maybe isn't at a place where they're going to spend that much on advertising or just wants to understand the fundamental structure, here's how I would start. Right. So the way I would look at it is I would look at my my top line revenue goal. Right. Like how much do I think is coming in? Let's just call it 10K in a month or something. Right. Then I would look at my projected overhead. Right. So I would say, OK, cool. Like of that 10,000, how do I need to allocate that? So to your point, I can still have a profitable business. The way I would do that, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the profit first model, but the way I would do that is I would have a predetermined percentage for money that I'm paying myself the same way I would in personal finance, right? So before I'm doing anything else, if I got 10,000 that came in and 10,000 is going to my profit account, that's the first thing I'm doing, right? So now no matter what happens, I know that my baseline of from a profitability standpoint, I've already allocated money that I'm not touching, mm-hmm. right? Then... I would allocate about 15%. And again, it's going to vary, right? Based upon the nature of your business, how much revenue is coming in, those percentages can fluctuate. But another 15% just for like your tax reserves, right? To have that. Now, if you have, you understand tax planning, you're probably not going to have to use a lot of that for your tax bill because there's going to be a lot of different levers that you can pull, right? For that, mm-hmm. let's just say, hey, look, let's go ahead and at least have it available, right? Just in case that happens, right? Then you have your operating expense account, right? For me, um, I like to keep that around like 30 to 40, right? But that's because I run a fairly lean business model with hyper efficient with our systems. Um, but like you, you want to set a percentage for that. And then what happens is, and actually I have the spreadsheet I can send y'all. What it'll do is it'll auto tell me, like when I put in my projected overhead, like how close I am to exceeding that number. So I can go in and kind of check like, okay, well, what, do I'm, what am I spending money on? Because what a lot of people do, their, their, their business model is based upon looking into their business bank account, seeing if there's money there, and then that's if they don't know if they can spend something, right? But real business is forecast, right? We forecast. It's like, okay, cool. I can spend this money on advertising, or I can spend this money on a new hire, or I can spend this money on a new computer, because when I looked at my forecast, it's showing me that I have, will have this in my budget. It's not me looking at my bank account, seeing that there's money there today, Right. And so that di- dictates what I can do that month. Now, here's the beautiful thing about entrepreneurship. If I look at my operating expenses and I'm like, whoa, in order to do what I want to do this month, I would need at least, I, I would need at least another two, three thousand dollars to be able to do it, then go make some more money, right? <laughs> Focus on how you're going to be able to attract more clients, right? I talk about paid advertising, but there's so many strategies that you can do to get people to the door. So many strategies that you can do. You can do a giveaway strategy where it's like, hey, look, I'm going to give away this ebook, right? And if, uh, all you got to do is sign up and blah, 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 right? You're going to get 500 people to sign up. You give away two, three copies. Then on the back end, hey, thanks so much for entering in. We already selected a winner, but would love to still give you a copy at 10% mm-hmm. off, right? So there's so many different ways, but you have to, as the business owner, when you see the numbers, you make objective decisions about what needs to happen based upon those numbers, Right. And then in the beginning, before you're on like formal payroll, it might be simple to just say every month, I'm going to pay myself 10, 15, 20 percent of what the business makes. Right. And then at some point, what you want to do when the revenue starts to come in more significantly, you want to cap that percentage at a certain point, keep your uh, your personal income fixed and then you allocate that to yourself. The last thing that I allocate is I call it the freedom fund. Right. And so 
one of the things that keep entrepreneurs stuck is not prioritizing the infrastructure that we talked about in their business. So every year, this is, if you guys have ever read the book Clockwork, it's a great, great read. Um, but it's the same concept. But basically the concept is you want to be able to take off from your business four to six weeks a year and nothing breaks, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have the systems, the operations and the process in place. So for me, what the Freedom Fund does is it, is, it has me prioritizing a certain amount of money so that I have no excuse. I mean, the one, if I realize, man, I got really got to upgrade the CRM system to HubSpot because we need to be able to better track and have better segmentation on our, our customer value journey. And then we can do this and we can do that. Now I'm not worried about, can I pull that money from my operating expense? I'm prioritizing a small pool of money every year to make reinvestments back into those things, right? To free me up, to create the business that it can run without me, to create the business that while I'm on this podcast, orders can come in. You see what I'm saying? It's like mm-hmm. you, you use that pool of money to number one, originally invest into the infrastructure. But then on the back end, it could even be like, hey, this is my, you know, six week travel fund, right? This is my sabbatical money, you know, because it's like I've earned it. I prioritized it. It's not taken away from the profit of the business because we've already allocated that. It's not taken away from the taxes. I'm not trying to give myself an unnecessary bonus. This is this is literally for my freedom because of the way that I set up the business. And that's how I think about different resources. That's major. Right? That's, hey, that's some beautiful gems right there. Hey, I, hey, and I do need you to shoot that spreadsheet over to us, my brother, because, yeah, cause, yeah <laughs> we need that. <laughs> you know, I got you. I got y'all. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate For it, sure. Well, George, man, we're going to pivot to the last segment of the show, my brother. So we're going to go into what's on your timeline. So we want to ask you, bro, what's something you've seen on the timeline that you just want to speak on? Yeah, what's on the timeline? Man, that's a good question. Um. Foolery. No, <laughs> it is some of that though. If it's foolery, nah, hey, speak on it. Speak on it, man. Now I'll, I'll talk to y'all about it online, but I, it's, it was it was super mess. I don't know if y'all saw. That. They think on Clubhouse. Now, well, that let's talk about that. I'll talk, I'll talk to y'all about the other one online. Yeah, Clubhouse. We, we can talk about that. Yeah, that was super messy. People was calling on people for scamming and you know all sorts of stuff. Like it was wild. I was like, ooh, like I heard this one conversation. They said they got it. They recorded it. They're gonna like report them to the SEC because they were talking about investments. I was like, Ooh. "Wow!" Yes. I was like, if "Somebody like me, I, my ears really perked up because I'm like, you know, I'm 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 one of the few people who actually had that license, right? So I'm like, you know, like I can't be out here, you know, getting connected to people who aren't who they say they are. Man, you gotta be careful in the internet streets, man, because people talk really good game. You know what I always say? So go go in. Hack some little, 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 little screen recording on them bank accounts or the investment accounts. I don't need to see the screenshot. Hit that little screen record. Show me, show me where you're at right now. You know what I'm saying? Um, that, that'll tell me everything I need to know, you know? But um, I digress. So yeah, people were getting called out for scamming and it was just, it was wild, man. It was wild, wild west over there. So that's something I saw in my timeline. Other than that, um, you know, it's top of the year. So I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, focused, uh, ready to tackle the year. And I'm not one of those Scrooges. I'm not going to say, you know, that he, you know, if he didn't do what she's supposed to do in 2020, it's not going to happen in 2021. I'm optimistic. I hope everybody finds their, finds their light, finds their lane and is able to win. Um, I just ask people to, you know, just be, do it incrementally, right? Show up every day. Um, I got a really good strategy for reading, you know, read two pages every hour that you're awake. You know what I'm saying? That's the average, like 32, 34 pages a day. If you sleep eight hours, um, you can read a 200 page book every week, 200 plus page book every week. So just start small. Right. Mm. Um, but again, not to digress. That, so I'm seeing on my timeline, a lot of new year cheer, people excited about the new year, trying to leave 2020 behind, uh, rightfully so. And, um, uh, the clubhouse foolery that, yeah. that I saw most yeah. recently. Man, that new year, you know, it's funny, man. I've started to see a whole lot less of that new year, new me stuff, but I am glad that people kind of, you know, still like optimistic with the future trying to change everything because mm-hmm. i know i know one whole thing that i thought was ridiculous is like seemed like everybody just thought that 2021 meant that everything that happened in 2020 was just gonna go away uh my boy right. kelly still got the vid um yeah. i just still had like you know what i'm saying like everything's still mm-hmm. happening guys it's just another A new year. day like you said the clock is just right. turning that's all it means <laughs> 
I do want to yep. speak on the SBA loans. If you see somebody talking about you can pay 125 and you can get an SBA loan for five to ten thousand, you can flip 125 to ten thousand. Please do not do that. No, please. Are <laughs> like you doing that? Yes, please. People are out here posting that you can turn 125 to ten thousand and live off your business. Please do not do that. Ooh, wee, they That's going you, to this jail. Shit, you can take a stimulus, start a business, and then do it. Yes, please don't do that. Oh, y'all going yeah. to jail. Do not listen to these people on the internet. Like my brother George said, be safe on these internet streets, man. They, yeah. they grind me at you. And that's weird, man. Like I said, time will promote our exposure. So, <laughs> you know, it's only so long you can fake the funk. Hey, I love I love that quote. That might be the uh, the name of this episode. <laughs> it's only so long you can fake the funk. <laughs> I love the phrase promotion. fake the funk. <laughs> I was talking about the time. <laughs> oh man, my bad, man. I, I, I like the I like the freeze pick the phone. My bad. <laughs> but George, my brother, thank you so much for coming on, man. We appreciate it. this. Has been a great episode. Could you please tell the people where they can follow you at on social media, how they can tap in with your services at Capital Wise, where they can how they can support you with melanin money, um, how they can get on, yeah, with my pocket advice, just all that, my brother. Yeah, whatever you got going yeah. on, bro. Yeah, absolutely. So uh easiest way to find me Damn, is so on Instagram, um, George Atchenpong Jr. Uh, you can find me. They're probably putting the show notes. I know you heard the last name. It's like, okay, I'm going to try to find you, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to find you. Um, and in my bio, the first link you'll see, um, it will take you to the pocket of it, my pocket advisor page where you can hop on the wait list. And, and I also make sure they have the link for the show notes. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, Capital Wise is my registered investment advisory firm. So if you're at a place where you are likely to be the, the first generation millionaire in your family and you want to make sure you are able to build out your financial team and really have a comprehensive strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, then head over to Capital Wise. It's more of an intimate experience. Uh, Pocket Advisor will be more of community driven, which I love. I think it's going to be super, super dope. But at some point you might be in a, in a, in a place where you really have evolved and you, know, you want to make sure that all your ducks are in a row. You need to work with an advisor in a more intimate capacity. And that's what you can do over uh, Capital Wise. Um, of course, naturally, you know, our bread and butter is investment advisory as well. So if you want done for you investing, right, if you want us to build out a portfolio for you, you just want to be able to put your money in there and not have to worry about it. Uh, you can do that. We have something really, really cool coming out that hopefully should be live when this podcast drops called the Stock Shop, right, where you'll be able to literally go to our site the same way you go to Zara, and, you know, Amazon, any any e-commerce store and buy your favorite brands. You can now buy your favorite brands. Don't let that go over your head. <laughs> um, and so Bar. stock shop is exciting. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, I just try to do revolutionary shit. Like, I'm gonna keep it a buck, which I've been humble for a long time, but like, it's all like, Talk it's coming shit, together. Yeah, man. Talk that you shit, know? man. Like you said, yeah. it's been 10 years in the making. 10 years in the making. We've had some, some, some nice milestones along the way, but this year it's going to be, it's going to hit a little different. Um, so yeah, we got the stock shop. That's going to be super cool. Uh, of course, all investments are still held with uh, in custody with a broker dealer, but you have the experience of being able to simplify how you learn about investments and how you are able to uh, start the process to own them. So that's coming coming in January. We're gonna go ahead and make sure my web designer don't play them. Make sure she hear this episode. It's coming in January. Um, and melanin money, right? So every wealth builder, every you know team black wealth, you got to have your uniform. You know what I'm saying? And so. Go to melaninmoney.com, you know what I'm saying, to grab your gear. If you don't get it, grab it. It's going to show up on your timeline one way or the other. You're going to have to get it. Um, but yeah, melaninmoney.com, the official uniform of Black Wealth. Go ahead and grab that. Got a lot of new dope merch drops coming in 2021. Super fire merch drops coming. So check that out. Um, I also have a podcast, The Uncensored Show. Um, so check that out. I give a lot of free game on there. And uh, yeah, I think... That, that pretty much rounds it out. If I miss something, just tap in with me on social and I'll be sure to share it there. I love, love it, to hear it, my brother. Love it. Love it. Like, appreciate once again, you. my brother, we appreciate you so much for getting on here. Um, yeah, thank you for get stopping kicking by. these gems. It's been a great with us. Yeah, it's been a great episode. I know somebody going to lead this thing with some value. They, they especially at 3S system, man, it's etched in my yeah, head. Man. You got me thinking. 3S's. Um, just be patient. You know what I'm saying? Scale. Yeah, all you said, man, scale, 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 scale. But you're just gonna you're gonna stretch yourself out. You're gonna have bad customer reviews. Um, just take your time. Do it right. You know what I'm saying. And I think if people can focus on that, they'll build a business that they can they can actually enjoy. Um, and and because you don't want to build something and, and end up building a cage, right? It's like, man, I grew this thing, and because I don't have the systems in place, I'm 
responding to all these emails. Nothing's automated. There's not triggers in place. There's not people's in place. Like you don't want that. Right. So sharpen twice, cut once and uh, you'll build something really, really special. He a poet ain't even know it, man. This guy. I'm not, I'm not about to play with this dude. But look, y'all, before we wrap this thing up, we're going to have a, talk, a couple of the house cleaning items. As always, everybody, thank y'all for tuning into the Black Wolf Renaissance podcast. We love and support y'all. Y'all, thank y'all for tuning in week in and week out. Uh, We want to make sure we're giving y'all the best content possible. So y'all make sure y'all giving us that feedback, man. We really love hearing from y'all, hearing how the show has impacted your life, how just any anything that we've done, any way we've been able to touch or help or improve anybody. Just let us know, man. We love hearing back from you guys. Uh, y'all tap in with our book. As I mentioned before, Manage Your Money Like the 1%. Uh, if you're a person trying to get your personal finances in order, if you're trying to get your credit together, we got our course, Credit Fundamentals 101. Uh, that's been going really well. We got some good feedback on that so far. So if you another per- you're trying to master your credit, you struggling with your credit, and you don't really understand credit, that's what that course is all about. We try to break down the game for you all so that y'all can move with the knowledge that with the knowledge so that you can actually handle this stuff yourself. Like you don't want to have to pay for credit repair every time you need to get your credit together. And that's mm-hmm. what we did with that. Uh, Jay, uh, Jalen Kelly, y'all got anything? Uh, I just want to say thank you all for rocking with us. Uh, please like comment, share, subscribe, um, and keep rocking with us and, and, and let us know what y'all want to hear. You know, we, we take any type of suggestions or, any, any person you want us to reach out to to try to see if we can have on the podcast, please let us know. You know me, man. I just want to say thank y'all. Welcome to 2021. We still going strong. I want y'all to be, you know, be positive and just look up and let's keep on working and keep on growing this year. Y'all be on the lookout for some of the great things that we got coming. Um, and we really just focused on giving y'all the most value and just giving y'all the best experience that we can. So appreciate y'all. Well, thank you guys for having it's, it's been a, it's been a pleasure um, getting to see the guys behind the the explosive uh, Black Wealth Renaissance movement. Man, really proud of what you guys are doing. Um, inspired me as well. So, guys, keep it keep up the good work. Thank Appreciate you, my brother, you, my brother you, definitely. And on that note, y'all, this is Black Wealth Renaissance signing out. Peace. Peace. I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my line unless it's money on the phone.